thank you very much for coming out on a, fr a Thursday, Friday. I'm not quite sure where we are in this week. Um, uh, for the evening uh, to hear me rabbit on. Um, the internet and how we got it all so wrong is the topic, which I guess probably raised a few eyebrows because, you know, the internet is fabulous. Fabulous. So how could we possibly have got it all so wrong? Well, in a way we have, and that's kind of what I want to explore tonight. Um, I don't have answers necessarily, but I thought this would just be sort of raise some thinking, yeah, about it. So um, first things first, I hate PowerPoint with an absolute vengeance. Uh, not just PowerPoint, PowerPoint-like things, okay? To me, there's nothing, um, so this is Apple Keynote, just to be, you know, a bit left field. Um, the, the reason I say that is I absolutely hate going to presentation where there's a bunch of text put up on the screen and then the person just reads every line to you and then goes to the next slide. I think that's just absolute bollocks, frankly, um, and not my style at all. So um, this is gonna be a bit kind of free-flowing. I've made some notes. Um, of, of things that I wanted to sort of cover off. So we may wander, we may end up talking about coffee grinders or something, but um, it's a huge topic and there's no way we could keep talking about this until Tuesday next week. Uh, and all the cameras would run out of batteries and you would fall asleep. Um, but we're gonna try and wander around a whole bunch of topics and areas and hopefully a few funny bits and a bit of some background, but perspective is always useful. Because unless you understand the perspective, it's quite hard to really get a grasp of just how bad things are now, okay? Um, and when I said how we got it all so wrong, I do mean the we. Everybody is culpable in this, okay? Um, it'd be very easy to go off and blame Elon Musk or the mad Zuckerberg or whatever, we're all culpable, okay? Um, so I hate PowerPoint. Um, there are not many slides. Most of the slides are just illustrating a particular point. Um, I've got a few demo bits, which I think might be interesting and again, illuminate a point. So um, there's a current theme, there's a thread that runs through this um, and it is this. The only thing that matters is trust. The only metric that matters is trust. If you go and buy something from a shop, you trust that it's the right thing, it's not going to kill you if you're buying some food. If you're buying a piece of IT equipment, you assume, hopefully, that it's a reputable company, that they're gonna service it, there's gonna be firmware support, it's not gonna be full of security bugs, and it's actually gonna do what it said on the tin. That is impossible to earn easily. And so many companies make it so wrong, okay? But there's a thread that goes through this discussion which is all about trust. And part of trust, as we'll come on to, is identity. Who are you talking to? Are they who they say they are? Are they representing the organization that they say they are? Whose interests do they have at heart? Because I pretty much guarantee most of the time it isn't yours, okay? So trust is a really, really big thing for us because you can talk about value for money, you can talk about product delivery times, you can talk about all sorts of really lovely things that make accountants happy. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't actually work, if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, there's a huge breakdown in trust. And I'm very tired of companies saying, we are X, Y, Z, you should just trust us. You know, I'm really, really tired of that crap. Um, so trust is a thread that will go through this and part of the whole uh, umbrella of trust is identity, who, what, where, why, whatever. So I guess quick sort of introduction of who am I and why the hell am I here? I visited here during pandemic. I didn't know it was here. I know about uh, Bletchley Park and they're fabulous and they've got, you know, Colossus and all that stuff. And, you know, but they'll probably hate me to say it. Please do, please do go look at Bletchley Park. It's a fabulous place. But I discovered this place. And I, Computer Museum Place, Cambridge. I drove here and I was then really confused because this used to be a Lotus dealer. And I used to have my car serviced here. And it was like, no, how are we doing Computer Museum? And I wandered around. Fantastic place here. Absolutely fantastic. I could, well, I have spent hours and hours and hours here. Mostly feeling very old, actually, because there's, <laughs> I'm going around saying, yeah, I had that and did that and yeah, did some development work on that. Shit, you know. 
feels very, very old. So I am John Honeyball. I'm contributing editor of PC Pro magazine, um, which is kind of like last man standing in serious computing in the UK. We saw off everybody. Um, this, this is actually the a PDF of the next issue, which we should be landing with subscribers any day now. Um, I've got that plug in for you. Uh, how did I get into writing? This is going to be a quick little aside. There is a reason for doing it. 1990, um, I left the job I was doing and I set up my own firm because it seemed to be I was the only person in the UK who knew how to do soft fonts on an HP LaserJet 2. And I made an absolute stinking fortune in the city of London generating uh, Helvetica in various typeface sizes so it worked on screen and worked on the printer. Um, and I started writing for a magazine called PC User. You, for those of you who are very old, they've probably got some issues here in the library, I guess. PC User was a really cantankerous fortnightly magazine run by Chris Long. And I had a phone call one day and it was Chris Long. I was like, oh, God, hell. I kept writing saying, this article is crap. And they kept awarding me this um, book, um, book voucher. For some, some strange reason, I never seemed to receive the book voucher, but I kept winning it. Um, and I, I went down and they said, oh, can we, we had some lunch. They said, can, we, um, can we have the first one by the end of next week, please? And I said, the first what? And it was the first um, World of Windows column. And it was my little three-page ghetto every fortnight, just as a little rant about things that had pissed me off. Um, and I, my first column was all about how people didn't understand logical pixels per inch in screen drivers and stuff. You know, it was really really great stuff. Uh, we then launched something called Windows Magazine that lasted for about two and a half years at Dennis Publishing. And then Felix Dennis, who was a wonderful guy, if you get to see some um, YouTube videos of Felix Dennis, he was a real character. And he said, well, Windows mainstream, can't do that. New magazine, please, PC Pro, launch a new magazine. And we took the ideas that we had done with Windows Magazine and created something called PC Pro. We are now on issue 343 issues. God almighty. 1994, November 1994, and I've written for everyone because I designed the magazine back then. I took my Windows NT column, my God, I had a Windows NT column in Windows magazine in 1992 and created the um, real world computing contributor section thing. And I write the back page. Um, we do a podcast every week and we have eminent people who come along and heckle, which is fabulous. Um, and uh, we now, we've just done episode 628 as of this lunchtime. So it's every Thursday live, come along and shout. Um, we may actually even open up the microphones of some people to come and join in and shout. That could be really quite fun. So that's, that's that stuff. The problem is, uh, that's what I'm known for, because that's what I'm known to manufacturers for. That's what I'm known to Microsoft and, and so on and so forth. But it's only ever been less than one day a month for me. And I've actually got a real job. Um, and the real job is a product R&D and test lab in Huntingdon now. I've been in Huntingdon for uh, coming up for 13 years. And it's a very dark lab. We don't talk about who we are, what we do. We certainly don't talk about who we work for. Um, and we specialize in the test evaluation um, and R&D of consumer and business grade electronic stuff. So currently in the lab, we are testing laptops, tablets, laser printers, screens, desktops, keyboards, mice, networking switches, firewalls, Wi-Fi infrastructure, security software. Just, you know, it's a fabulous sandpit. And we look at about four to 500 products a year. Okay, in an extremely structured and um, uh, a comparative way. I can't tell you who we work for. You could probably put two and two together and make seven, and that's fine. Uh, but we also are called upon by various organizations to help them work out what the hell they're supposed to be doing in the future and what they're doing wrong at the moment. No names, pat, no pack drill. Um, we have something called ISO 17025 accreditation, which is an international standard for a competent test lab. And that is a major ball ache to get. It means every part of your process, everything you do down to HR, how you handle results, how you handle calibration, how you do it, just everything, all has to be written down um, and externally audited. And on the back of that, we are the only 
uh, lab that we know of in the world that is 17025 accredited for um, subjective sound quality, subjective print quality, subjective screen quality, for example, because no one else has ever had the, the guts to try and get it, and we did. Um, the lab, this is when we opened the lab, the new lab, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, unbelievably tidy. Um, it's not like that now. Um, another view of the lab. You know, we have serious toys and serious toys if you think this was 10 years ago. But one slightly important point here is um, on the wall you'll see lots of framed photographs which were actually printed on this horrendously huge Epson printer. Uh, and for us, um, ISO and IEC test procedures are a very, very tiny part of what we do. Uh, the vast majority of what we do is uh, procedures that we've designed and built ourselves over the years. Okay, and the reason for that is either the ISO, IEC, British standards, standards don't exist, or if they do, they're just hilariously out of date or crap. Um, which means as a lab, we can't hide behind an ISO spec. If you came to us with a something and said, do this according to an ISO spec, a lab will say, well, here it is, we're accredited to do the test, here's the result, go away. We can't do that. Um, so source material, whatever we do, whether it's sound, print quality, whatever, we have to know where it came from, what it's supposed to look like. You can't just take a picture off the internet and print it because you don't know what lens it was, what camera body it was, how it was processed, etc. So that's an example of photography stuff. And we have a huge library of reference print, uh, printing material um, because we have to have it. Uh, we also do audio. Um, that is actually one of my team and Tony Faulkner, who is probably the best classical recording engineer in the world. This is Air Studios in London, which was um, George Martin's studio. And uh, we were recording, you can't see through the window, we were recording uh, the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. Tony was doing it for real and we were doing a complete parallel recording. And we have a full set of pro recording equipment and, you know, and we've recorded at Abbey Road and London Symphony Orchestra and stuff like that and all the rest of it. Because unless you know what it is you're looking at, how do you evaluate whether the thing is doing it correctly? Okay, um, and to do some of the technical stuff, we have Charlie. Charlie is a head and torso simulator from Graz Acoustics in Denmark. It has an IEC voice box. It has ears with 50 kilohertz frequency response. He's about 55,000 quid. Okay, but if you want to measure a headphone or a microphone boom or something like that and measure it objectively and correctly, um, you need something like this. Um, when I talked about stuff that we do because there is no method and we have to build one, here's a great example. We were given the question of how do you measure the diffusion of a diffuse screen coating on a screen? Yeah, so hard reflection versus that sort of diffusion. I came up with the idea of bright light, photographic in the dark, etc, etc drop it into the world's greatest piece of software, which is Wolfram Mathemat Mathematica, um, load the image in, create a three-dimensional array, and then you can actually slice the cone and see how it changes over luminance, because luminance is the, is the height component here of the luminance of here. And you can also see things like the color squirrels you get off an o off a, um, OLED panel. Um, and yeah, we are big boys, we have proper accreditation. So that's kind of what we do for real. I wanted to cover off a bit of computer history to set some perspective on this thread that's going to run through what we're talking about. So um, ARPANET, we all know what ARPANET is, yeah? Heckling is good, okay? ARPANET was America, ARPANET was the precursor of the internet and it joined up the sort of the um, American uh, university and military complex in, in the States. Okay, started in 66, operational in 1971, TCP IPv4 that we all know and love, because that's how we talk to the world, um, went live in January 83. Now, early 80s is really important for a number of reasons that I'm going to come on to. And so TCP IP live went live. Who knows what Janet is or was? Oh, you must be at Cambridge, no? Okay, so joint academic, net, joint academic network. Okay, Janet joined up all the major universities, Surrey, Cambridge, London, Manchester, Liverpool, Oxford, etc. Um, it was launched 1st of April 84. 
We're back to 83, 84 again, and this is really quite key. And these were basically mainframes at universities, and they were all joined together on something called X25 pads. You remember? Very, very slow. You're not that old, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, I am. Yeah, yeah. Uh, X25 <laughs> signaling on things called pads, which were the interface boxes, um, were what British Telecom provided as lease lines to wire things up. They were stupidly slow, like nine kilobits a second or something. I mean, how are you supposed to do anything over that? But that's what, that's what Janet was, okay? Um, I was at university from 82 to 86 at Surrey, and we had the largest prime computer cluster in the world. There were four 750s, two 550s, and two 250s. Um, and in 1984, uh, me and a mate um, broke it. I mean, really broke it. I mean, we not only broke the mainframe cluster at Surrey, we broke Janet, all of it. We had root access on the entire Janet infrastructure of mainframes at all the universities in the UK. Um, am I proud of this? Oh, actually, yes, I am, actually, because, God, it was fun. Um, and um, I actually, sorry, my friend, who is, I still talk to, who we were doing it, uh, remember we talked about trust? Okay, they had just installed Primos onto these mainframes. And they had no idea what they were doing at the University of Surrey because the documentation stack was this tall. And I know it was this tall because we asked for a set of the documentation and they sent it over from the computer library. It was this tall. And it was like, bloody hell, you know. But back then, a mainframe operating system, you built it yourself. You compiled it up, you decided how you did it, you put your security in, etc. Unfortunately, they screwed up. Um, and it also helps if you don't have sysops from the computer department getting drunk in the students' union. Because we discovered about what was called a background process, called a, a, a phantom process, which was the print spooler. And the print spooler was basically a text file that contained in the text file amongst a pile, of, a pile of garbage. But in there, there was the username, the password of the account, and the file in there storage area to be printed off to a line printer, okay? So if you got that print file, print log, you had everyone's username and password who had printed anything, which was a bit embarrassing when you had people who were super users logging in and then printing something, forgetting they were logged in as super users because now you suddenly had their username and password and then you could create more super users. Um, it was really good for extending the um, CPU time allocation for people because you only got like three and a half seconds a term but three and a half seconds on a mainframe was a lot. And you got, we got a lot of beer out of that. Um, and um, we then broke CircNet. That got us into Rutherford Appleton. Um, the username password login for the mail access account over X25 pad was mail and mail. Um, if I remember correctly, the username and password for God mode on all of the mainframes on Janet was the same. Because it made it easier to send files around, you know, like, who, who, <laughs> um, okay. Um, why do I raise that? Who were you, uh, why were you trusted? This thread of trust, this thread of identity. We managed to take on the personality and capabilities of the root access on the mainframes and the backbone of the whole of Janet. And it wasn't difficult. Um, Prestel, do you remember Prestel being broken by my really good friend, Robert Schifrin and Steve Gold, who is sadly passed away, 1984, 1984 again. We were all being very naughty in 1984. Uh, Rob Schifrin and Steve Gold hacked Prestel, um, told Prestel about it, who didn't believe them. And they then had access to Prince Philip's mailbox. You may remember that, yeah? Um, a very famous case. And that directly led to the Computer Misuse Act of 1990, was Rob Schifrin um, and, and Steve Gold. Our little antics with um, Janet undoubtedly helped, shall we say. Um, important point here, badly set up systems, well ahead of the curve, the uh, political and legal frameworks, nowhere, nowhere to be seen. 
Okay, another thought to, to, to put away. Anyone heard of Kix, CIX, Computer Information Exchange? Were you on Kix? Back in the, oh, heavens, well done, sir. Um, it was founded in 1983 by those arch hippies, Frank and Sylvia Thornley. Uh, it was a FIDO bulletin board. Uh, then, then it was COSI software that ran on a PDP-11. Um, sister platform for this was Bix, that Byte magazine, if you remember Byte magazine, they ran Bix in the States. Um, strange little thing, Dick Pounton, who's still editorial fellow of PC Pro, was a big columnist on Bix back in the 90s, if you remember his columns. Um, on Kix, we had open conferences, we had closed conferences, and we had closed confidential conferences. Open ones were open to anybody, closed ones were closed, you had to be let in. Closed confidential, you had to be let in, but you didn't even know they existed. All sorts of naughtiness went on on Kix, okay? Um, and it was not helped when someone who logged in by the name of Floppy um, gained access to uh, a, a conference called Adult. And you can imagine the balloon went up and the whole, uh, he was actually, this person named Flocky was an, uh, a journalist working for one of the red tops. I think it was the Daily Mail. I can't remember, but it went horrible. Um, so the point here is just knowing who, you're, who people are is not really enough. And if you don't know who they are, you most certainly can't trust them. Okay. Um, Usenet, whoever used Usenet, NNTP. Yes, of course you would have done all the gray hairs in the room. Um, we all know what the September effect is. It's when the 18-year-old American students went to university for the first time and discovered Usenet, right? So the quality of the discussion went down every September because all these youths piled into Usenet. I, I'm not putting you in this category, I, I promise you. But they all came in and said, oh, how do you make this? You know, horrible. Again, you don't know who they are. Anyone remember Rusty and Edie? Okay, Rusty and Edie, this is a really good one. Rusty and Edie was a really rock and roll wild uncontrolled bulletin board in the States. And to get to it, you actually had to phone internationally on your modem. The bills were astronomical. Um, they were most noticeable for two things. One was a, a, a truly heroic quantity of porn. And the other was a heroic quantity of pirate software. Um, they were so good that the FBI got legislation through the American government and then raided Rusty and Edie and shut them down in um, uh, January 1993. That was based on October 1992 um, Congress law for software piracy. Again, do you know who you are? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Who are you talking to? Demon Internet. We all remember Demon Internet. Yeah. Demon Internet started on kicks. Um, Cliff Stanford, who ran a little software company in North London, doing a apricot based accountancy software, if I remember rightly, decided he wanted a lease line into his office and then decided he'd get a whole bunch of his mates to pay for it. So a conference on kicks was created called Tenor a Month, whereby you gave him a tenor a month and you had access via modem dial-up into the internet, real TCP IP internet. Uh, that was launched 1st of June, 1992. Uh, opinions vary whether it was 100 of them, 100 of us who signed up or um, 200 of us who signed up, but DM internet just suddenly went through the roof. And back then it was really difficult. You had to roll your own TCP IP stack and uh, KA9Q for your emails and stuff. Truly horrible. Um, oh, sorry, there was, a, there was a photograph I was going to show you. There. That was the Prime mainframe cluster at Surrey. I forgot, I should have shown you that. That's Prime 550, uh, 250, I think, 5, 550 or 750, 750 and so forth. And that's what we broke um, and all the other universities equivalents of. Okay, I'll remember to do slides. Um, World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee. There is a next computer out there, which is very lovely. I'm sure you've all had a little play with it, and I believe it's actually signed by Tim. Yeah? Um, Tim invented the World Wide Web. He was at CERN. This was a proposal that came up in 1989. That's the original proposal for the World Wide Web. Um, a working system came out in 1990, including a browser and a server. It was released to other institutions in January 1991, and then went public August 1991. Um, that is the first documentation on hypertext protocol, text, text documents with embedded bits running on a Next. And there's a lovely Next Cube out there in the museum. I have a Next Cube and a Next Slab and one of the very rare 400 DPI 
black and white um, laser printers that they did. And that's what Steve Jobs did while he was away from Apple. And when he went back to Apple, next step became the foundation of OS X, OS X. Um, okay. World Wide Web took off like wildfire. It was, it was incredibly simple. It was really simple because it was a way to have a document that linked you with a clickable thing to another document. But the other document could be at your university or at CERN, or it could be somewhere else because there was a URL, a universal resource locator that enabled you to find, to locate a resource out in the universe. Great idea. Brilliant idea. Brilliant idea. And it was client server. There was a server component that you talked to over port 80 on the uh, HTTP protocol. And you could then just hop between documents. Great idea. Um, this was my website in 1997. Unfortunately, the Wayback Machine doesn't keep all of the, all of the images. Um, this was Microsoft's website in 1998. Um, and it, it took off like wildfire. Problem, when you did an HTTP request, you linked to a text file somewhere in a file system of a of, of, of a computer which had a web server looking at the file system. It doesn't scale. And lots of stuff is not held in text files, it's held in databases. So very quickly, the whole thing rapidly, rapidly changed, and we got to database-driven backends that composed the HTML text page on the fly out of a database. And this was really useful for things like stock lists of products or that kind of tabular type of stuff, um, or building pages on the fly. Um, then someone came along with a really stupid idea, which was to make things, uh, to, to, add a, to add a payment basket so you could buy things. Because if you could list things, you could list the things you had for sale and, and have a basket and say, I want five of those and ten of those and three of those, please put them in the basket, hit go and pay for them and have a shopping experience. And that was great. That was fabulous. Um, Except people said, ooh, we can put advertising into this. And we can put, adver ooh, we put advertising in. We can insert adverts. So we, we had a rise of those little sort of banner adverts that happened. Um, and banner adverts, people, they start off just being dumb. You know, show this advert to all the people who come to your website and I'll give you this amount of money. And then the, the advertising people who are quite canny said, oh, hold on, let's put a unique code onto each advert. So if someone clicks through it, we know who they were. And we get to one of the core points of the evening, which is all of a sudden tracking the user became really important to that industry. Not important to you and me, but very important to them. And advertising drives these services. And this is where we really should have had the alarm bells ringing. You know, we should have all been saying, hold on, this is not very good because everyone was suckered for free services. You want free email, you want free browsing, you want free this, you want free that. No one actually really turned around and said, who's paying for this? Where's the money coming from? And the answer is, it was coming out of the advertising being sold at you. But then this took a really major turn, which is, it wasn't just enough to kind of know who you were. It became really important to model who you were. What were you really interested in? What else might you be interested in? What are your friends interested in? Who are your friends? Are your friends interested in the same thing that you're interested in? What is the, this, this, this global mesh of connections between people? And suddenly we were absolutely screwed. Because at this point, it became possible to improve the empirical quality of the advertising spend for the advertiser at the expense of you and me. Because all of a sudden, you could become identifiable as someone who is much more likely to buy this item or you buy some other item and therefore the value to you to the industry went, went massively up. Um, and so targeting people became a really big thing. Silly question, um, what is Tesco's? Shop. It's a shop, yep. Lots of shops around the country, yep. No, it's surely the one of the biggest data mining companies in the world. Sure. Correct. But anyway, Tesco's could quite happily exist without any stores. 
They could franchise out the stores and just tell each store what to do. Because Tesco's is a phenomenal, I'm just taking Tesco's as an example, they're not particularly special in this. Um, they have an exact model of the demographics of a town, what size place to put it, where to put the products, on which shelf height, where in the store, what pricing to do on them, modelled on what they know about the people in that area, typical customer profiles, who, buy what, who buys what with what, and so forth. Their data modelling and modelling of similar companies is quite terrifying. A good friend of mine works, who I've known since university, works in this kind of modelling stuff for someone quite big in this space in the UK. No names, no patrol. And about four years, five years ago, he said, we have some reasonable confidence now that we can tell that a lady is pregnant before she knows. And I said, what? Yeah, about month two, she starts changing her shopping habits. I said, you must be mad. Nope. I am not the advanced statistician that he is and I don't have the data modelling and I don't have the data, but I believe my friend because there's no reason for him to lie to me and they know to a reasonable confidence. That is terrifying. That is behavioural analysis at a level we've never seen before. Now imagine this effectively scaled to a global level. No. It is known who all my friends are, who their friends are around the globe. They know who your friends are around the globe. Okay. This whole idea of, what was it, f f five axes of Kevin Bacon or whatever it is, yeah? You know, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, you know, you can get from me to Putin probably in four steps. I'm not proud of that fact, but I probably know someone who knows somebody who knows Putin. Okay. And of course, there are some people who are sort of, you might sort of call them hyper-connected people. You know, I have met and spent a lot of time with Bill Gates. He knows a lot of people, you know. Um, it's not that I've met you and you know him and he knows you and suddenly we're at Putin. It doesn't quite work like that. But there are people who are hyper-connected. And that's modelled. That is now the data set that's out there, okay? Um, the advertising is terrifying. 2022 figures, Google, Alphabet, profit 283 billion where did that money come from it didn't come from working on vr headsets and augmented reality because they're losing a billion a month on that um no it came out of their monstrous advertising engine facebook 116 billion facebook got caught out for actively creating phantom users in their system apparently to connect me to you through him it didn't know that he existed, but it knew that I knew people who knew this person like him. You knew people who knew that person through him. And therefore, it created a profile for this person who didn't actually exist in the system, had never logged in, but had made the, the linkage. OK. This is terrifying. <coughs> and we let it happen. Um, let's just go sideways here. Come out of that. And hopefully I can do this. OK, and if there is the miracle of technology, I believe this is the world's most visited news website, Daily Mail. I, 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 I heard it somewhere. OK, so what I want to do here is I just want to uh, refresh Daily Mail. Here it comes in, lum, 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 dum, 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 adverts and so forth. And we all know what the Daily Mail looks like. But what I want to do now is uh, be a little bit more cunning and live demos, never do them. Um, come in here. I'm sure you all know this, but maybe some of you don't. Um, I'm going to come into developer tools. There's developer tools. I've got cache disabled. Uh, I'm looking at network, right. Now let's reload this page. Look at this bit here, if you can, and the quantity of stuff that's coming in. OK, it's still loading. It's still loading. It can take up to 20 seconds to fully load the Daily Mail website. And there are thousands of items coming down. That's just what's landing with you. What now happens is you are fingerprinted. Your web browser is being fingerprinted. Um, they know who you are. 
through cookies, through um, uh, adverts, through browser fingerprinting, web beacons, which are one pixel sized um, image files. Uh, they started off on emails. You know, you, you, you'd, you'd open the email and the reading of the linked graphic went back to a unique URL of a unique one pixel graphics file held on a server. And at that point, they knew that you had opened that email and read it, right? There is a world of technology here called mapping who you are and what you are doing, okay? Um, there are some tools to help you, but this is, this is terrifying, okay? Because this fingerprint of who you are right now, the IP address I'm on, if I was stupid enough, the geolocation of where I currently am at, because um, you never share that, would you? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, that information, server side, goes into a real-time advertising brokerage engine globally. And in real time, they bid against the value of you loading that web page. And whoever wins the advert, uh, uh, the advert bidding in real time, in fractions of a second, is the one who delivers the advert onto the page. Okay? People don't know that this is happening. They just see this sort of not terribly informative website covered with adverts, but they don't realize that the whole thing has been personalized for you in real time. And if you went to that page from your browser on your computer, you get a different set of content, not just a set, different set of adverts, you may actually get a different set of content. Okay. Um, so there are tools that you can help with this, things like ghostery, fingerprinting, ad blockers, web beacon blockers, and so on and so forth. You can add into your browser to help obfuscate a lot of this stuff and basically lie back to the, lie to the back end and say, it's not really me, it, it's no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm that person. I'm, I'm not who you think I am, okay? And if you want to have any attempt at anonymity on the internet, you need to start running tools like this. Um, if I come over here, I, where's my mouse gone? Oh, wrong computer, that's why. Hardware error. Um, here. Now, this here is the per how we personalize your experience. This is the consent page right the way down in the depths of the Daily Mail website. Okay? And there are purposes and features, and it all looks really lovely. Legitimate interest. Consent. Yeah? All of this. Okay? Um, but there's a vendor's one here, which is really worth a look. Okay, so this is the list of vendors who are approved by associated no newspapers to gain access to your real-time data feed server side of what you're doing and all of this stuff. Okay, so this looks like a nice little list. So let me just start scrolling down, shall we? Yeah, it can't be many rows, can it? No, it can't be many rows. So let's sort of scroll a bit. These are all companies. These are all services that the Daily Mail is subscribed to and use on their web platform. I'll just keep scrolling for a bit. Let's go a bit faster, shall we? Because, let's go a bit far, you know, let's keep going. Let's just choose one here. Spring, um, Spring Scene LLC, now let's choose this one here. Read Peak OY is store and access information on a device, select basic ads, create a personalized ad profile, Select personalized ad, measure ad performance, develop improved products, la 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 la. Uh, that's just one row here. Let's just keep scrolling because let's keep going. How many companies do you think are involved in me getting that page from the Daily Mail? I'll keep scrolling. Should I keep scrolling? Let's just keep scrolling a bit further because after all, we must, we must be there surely by now. I mean, surely, surely, surely we're there. Uh, no, not quite. Let's keep, let's keep going because. Is it in alphabetical order? Uh, no, it's not. No. Uh, and if you wanted to turn them off, you have to come in here and turn them off each because, you know, you know. Let's keep scrolling. Shall I keep scrolling? Keep scrolling. We're, 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 all these companies, all these services. For, for this uh, new site. Let's keep, let's go. Oh, we're at the bottom now. 
That's what's going on in the background of the big websites out there, and you have no idea. Let me play devil's advocate then. You're getting adverts whether you like it or not. The fact they're personalised, is, is it a problem? Well, there's two sides to this. One of which is, do I get adver are, are people knowing about me, and then do I get the ad delivery? So there's two sides to that. One of which is, I can obfuscate who I am, so the advertising engine gets confused. Um, which helps mask who I am. Yeah. Then there's the issue of what's delivered down to me. And there are add-in tools that will basically rewrite the, 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 the incoming page stream because there are add-ins to the browser, so they have access to the entire DOM model. Um, and are there, are there users that exist that say, I want a personalised experience? I don't think there are. I think there are people who simply don't know that it's happening. Yeah. Because there's this whole thing of, well, uh, it's free. Okay. The problem is... Essentially, I am the product. You are the product. You are the product for everything happening out there. Um, and I'm not picking out the Daily Mail as being a particularly bad example. They are fairly egregious in this, but, you know, everybody has a go. If you want a real laugh, look at, <laughs> look at huntspost.co.uk for Huntington Post. My God, their website. You can chop it down from about 35 megabyte load for the first page down to about two if you just put a few ad blockers in and stop all the crap coming down. And that matters, because if you're on your phone, it's load time or it's data plan amount or it's just, it's just stuff which I didn't want. Now, do you think that if you went to the Daily Mail and said, oh, I'll give you £10 a month and I won't get all of this stuff, do you think they would stop doing this? No, Elon Musk, crazy guy, love him to bits, totally mad, um, has said that the pay version of Twitter, Twitter Blue or Twitter, whatever he's calling it this week, you will get nicer adverts, more cuddly adverts, okay? Um, do you think if you gave money to Google, they would stop data mining who you are, what you are doing inside Google, what page you're looking for, what page you click through on? Was it on page one? Was it on page two? because they are selling that advertising space to people who want to push their, their, their advert effectively further up the search ranking. Okay, that's what their business model is. And we've let it happen. Are there many other PC Pro websites? Well, I can say absolute guaranteed no, for one simple reason, there is no PC Pro website. There used to be, um, but there, we haven't had a yeah, politics of publishing. Um, we don't have a, a PC Pro website. Um, where, did, where, where did this logistical interest appear? You will see often where they have two that yes. alternates between a turned off by default and legitimate turned on by default. Yeah, it, it, it's really appeared over the last five, ten years as this whole ultimate reality world has been created, essentially, in this cloud back end of knowing about who you are. And there's some legal requirements to allow you to turn this off, but you know, you're gonna wear out a mouse clicking on these buttons, yeah? It's not just the internet. I mean, like when you're using your loyalty card. In okay. When you, you, your bank. Yep, you go into Tesco's, and it's a particular bet noir of mine. It's a particular thing that makes me very angry. You go into Tesco's and you buy something, and they now have something, they are so blatant about it now, they now have something called a club card price which could be half the price of the normal price. So if you go up and you take this item and you put it through the machine, you enter your club card and they will drop the price on it. Why? Because they're data mining you. But except they would be data mining you anyway because they know the credit card that you used to make the payment, even if you didn't use a Tesco club card. Okay? Um, there's all sorts of interesting things you can see on supermarket receipts. To store your credit card details. Um, or, because um, I deliberately don't carry the Tesco card because they don't pay me enough for it. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, there, there is, I was reading this morning, I was reading this morning about someone saying that on Tesco's receipts, and this is only what I heard from someone who I trust, that there is something called a, a, a payment authentication ID or something at the bottom of the, printed on the bottom of the receipt, which this person maintains is unique to his credit card at Tesco's. If you went into an Amazon store in London, you just walk in, you pick up what you want and you walk out again. 
because the whole thing is done on facial recognition cameras and knowing who you are and who your Amazon account is. You don't even have to go to a till. You don't have to check anything out. You just pick things up and walk out the store. Now, people like that. I get the point. But what's the downside? And the point I'm raising here is the internet has been and continues to be an incredibly wonderful thing. But as my dear departed mother used to say, everything in nature balances. If there's a really strong positive thing somewhere, you've just got to find it is the sign of corresponding negative thing. Now, you might say that the negative thing, negative thing you don't care about, it doesn't matter. That's fine. That's your choice. But please don't be blind to the fact that it happens. Because we can't turn around and suddenly say we have created and it is running now the most terrifying surveillance state globally. And we have let it happen. I'm just as guilty as anybody else. But I mean, we can rah rah and champion and say, you know, we shouldn't be having this stuff. The problem is the people who have got the legislative power out there to do something about this are 5, 10, 15 years behind the curve. Okay. Um, and John, do you see this getting worse? Oh, yeah, yes, I think it's getting worse. So, with the advent of the Bank of England CDB. <laughs> well, one of the things that you could do with that, of course, is control what someone spends it on. So your paycheck, um, if you were a uh, civil servant, it could be determined that of your monthly paycheck, uh, only 40% of it can be spent on household essentials and so forth. In my company, I issued credit cards to people. Mm -hmm. However, I then changed those to payment cards. Yep. It prevented them from going buying electronics. I prevented them from buying clothing. Yep. Payment cards have particular categories they can only buy. Yep. I understand why. I'm just saying what happens if that becomes the national currency? That's a whole level of state controlled super surveillance. Su super supervision. Surveillance. I can't even speak tonight. Um, so let's just roll on. Um, here's a slide. I'll come back here. Wrong computer. Uh, doo, 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 doo. Keynote. There we go. Hit play. Boom. So I would strongly suggest get yourself into developer mode on browsers and just have a look and see what's going on. It is quite terrifying. Um, they actually say on the Daily Mail website, we are advertisers make use information from within our web page to depend on whether you have an ad blocker enabled. We may store this associated with your device, including through the use of cookies, to reinsert advertisements on our website and to understand how our customers use ad blockers. The advertisements that are reinserted may include those from ad blockers whitelists or that promote our own products or services. So if they think you're running an ad blocker, they'll just shove them straight into the HTML stream anyway and re basically rewrite it and push it in. We reserve the right to restrict your access. Do not track was something that was put in by some of the privacy people. Yeah, Our websites do not respond to do not track browser settings. So screw you. you know, that's their policy. Um, so what have we got here? OK, I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to try and go as quick as I can. Um, there is a new 2022 code of practice on disinformation from the uh, European Union that actually went live last week worth a read but why wasn't this in place 15 years ago no and, uh, and we be uh, I'm sorry I'm not a politician um, uh, if you want to know the scope here Facebook currently has 2.95 billion users worldwide these are active billions. Uh, YouTube, 2.5 billion. WhatsApp, 2 billion. Instagram, 2 billion. WeChat, which of course is Chinese. Yep, 1.3. TikTok, billion. And the Americans are getting very upset about TikTok and its Chinese ownership. Um, Facebook Messenger, 0.9 billion. Others, Douyin, must be Chinese, I guess. Telegram, we know Snapchat, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Weibo and so forth. 2.9 billion are actively using Facebook. That is a monolithic data store modeling 3 billion of the world's population. And those that it doesn't know about, doesn't have accounts on, 
a significant proportion of them, I would bet they've got models as to who they are. Okay? So, here's a question. Take 15 years ago, mm -hmm. let's say when the 40 GDs out of the bottle. Yep. How many on that list exist? Of these companies? Yeah. Well, no, Facebook's relatively recent. I mean, last 15, 20 years. Sure. Uh, YouTube ditto, WhatsApp ditto, Instagram. But we knew 20 years ago this was going to happen. And we, we were saying to people, this is madness. Yeah? These are not companies that go back to 1992. I'm just saying, how many do you think would exist or look like they do Very, very little, if the proper social level protections have been put in place. So let's roll on quick, because otherwise you, you know, the food's going to arrive, and that will be terrifying. Um, Free versus payoff. If you actually paid for some of this stuff, would it get better? And I would contend it doesn't. It, it wouldn't happen. Um, we've now got this really scary thing, which is AI-driven um, chatbot stuff, which is a whole different level of um, obfuscation and confusion as to as to where this source of information has come from. We have no recognisable way of authenticating a fact on a page. Why? That's not what Tim meant back in 19, whenever it was, a, a 1992 or whenever it was, when you had a hyperlink. It took you to a document on, put on a server, of a, probably an academic server, by a good chap or a good lady. And it was an interesting piece of document. Now we have no concept whatsoever of whether the thing you've gone to is real, meaningful, spam, counter-terrorism, who knows? We have no idea. Chat GPT, terrifying. We were actually talking about it today on the PC Pro podcast. Online safety bill. We are going to see country level firewalls in my lifetime, without question. We have China doing it now, obviously, um, but we will, I would su suggest that it is not that far out to see the EU mandate a firewall around the EU, for example. Um, Code of practice on disinformation, I've talked about that. Um, we need curation. We desperately need curation, which is to say, I know where this came from, I know its content is good, I know it's reputable, and so forth. We never even managed it with Wikipedia. Duh. You know, people believe that everything on Wikipedia is true. It's an awful lot better than it was. And they do have little footnotes and links to articles, but the articles could be wrong. How do we have any kind of concept of, 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 of meaningful uh, validation of any of this stuff? This is why we have this huge problem with um, uh, political stuff, uh, disinformation. It was all about Trump and how using Facebook and so forth. This is not going to go away. Yeah. Um, and now the tricky one. I talked about identity, I talked about trust, and part of that thing about identity, and I could talk about identity for the next four hours, and I'll try and keep it brief. We don't know who anybody is out there. We are mandating that the service provision companies, the Facebooks, the etc., etc., use some sort of tool to work out whether this person is under the age of 18 or not. What hope in hell have they got? How difficult is it to create a Facebook account? Well, you go and set up a Google Gmail account and then go into Facebook and set it up and, uh, and boom, there you are. And you could be pretending to be a 45 year old, um, you know, man from Newcastle and you're actually a 14 year old girl from Cambridge. Um, here's the real kicker problem. The companies are saying, woo, we will use AI and magic and profiling and tracking trends and what's spiking and all of this stuff to try and provide an engine to control what's on our service, to protect the children. I don't mean that in a flippant way. I would, I'm, it's a very serious, very, very serious problem. You know, I don't have children myself. I have six, six nephews from the age of five to 27. And I look at the internet today and I think, good God, John, what have we made? The government is saying, it's your problem, you fix it, it's your platform. 
because the government doesn't want to do anything concrete about it. But they're going further than that. They're suggesting that they will have criminal responsibility. Oh, absolutely, yes. So they're um, upping the ante against the service provision company, yeah? But the government is saying, we want nothing to do, well, it's not our problem, it's your problem, it's your service, okay? Which is totally missing the point, because it's not. The only people who can provide authentication of who you are is the government. You have a passport, you have a driving license, you have all of these things which are government mandated identity. It could even just be a gas bill or, you know, bank account number, something, yeah? I don't want Facebook to be responsible for managing my identity. Thank you very much. Yeah? Like, no. I met Mr. Zuckerberg. No. Not happening. Uh, governments don't want to mandate this because that suddenly means ID cards. It's massively unpopular with the population because they all think data creep, data creep, because you're suddenly opening people's eyes to the fact that all of this shit has happened. Right? Well, the government, government IT projects mandated. are always successful, aren't they? Of course, sorry. Yeah, the government is mandating this because they're now requiring us to have some form of ID to present to vote. Yeah. So they're doing it by the back door. They're not admitting that we've got to have an ID card. Of course not. Yes, because there's going to be a cost involved. Yeah. And who is going, who as a local MP wants to go knocking around on doors and say to somebody who answers the door, oh, by the way, your 14 year old daughter, um, she's going to need to have an ID card to go on to social media. Instant vote loser. Not happening. So there's a cost, there's a vote losing. Politicians simply won't do it. What they will do is throw the problem over at the IT companies. Uh, the service provision companies and say it's your problem and if you do a really bad job we will come and spank you. Is this a sustainable future? Is this a path to getting ourselves out of this mess? Absolutely not, but that's where we're at. So uh, you asked the question, sorry I can't remember which one it was, are things going to get better? Uh, no, because it's in nobody's interest to make it go better. The online companies, Facebook, absolutely does not, under any circumstances, want to be responsible for producer for, for IDing people. Why? Because if they suddenly provide an ID that you are, of course, a 13-year-old lady from Manchester, which of course you are, um, uh, and you suddenly have got access to material you shouldn't have access to, it's now their criminal liability. So do you think that their business model will stand identifying 2.9 billion people around the world. A lot of their success is based on that anonymity, sure. Of course, yes, and they know that, and everybody knows this. But you can't expect 2.9 billion users of a system to be authenticated by Facebook. It's not going to work. You know, I use Facebook, but I have it in a very, very locked down. There's things you can do like Facebook containers, like on Fi Firefox. Facebook tries to see into every other web page you're currently using in your browser and it's sucking that information in. You didn't realize it was doing that, but there are tools you can do called Facebook containers, which actually hold the Facebook page and the runtime engine behind it into its own sandbox so it can't get into the rest of your bloody computer. Hello. Um, so, the, the children, the identity aspect, and it's not just parental control, it's control of parents. Parental control is, very badly named because it's assumed to be all about keeping children under control and keeping children safe. Actually, we need parental control for parents. What we need is a separation of what I call the separation of the oil and water of the internet into a trusted space and an untrusted space, where there will be services out there where you can only go to them if you're an authenticated user. To, uh, we, I could spend another two hours talking about cloud-based um, identity management under your control and so on and so forth. You know, that's another hour, or at least another half hour. I'll quite happily rant if you're, if you're eating your dinner. Uh, but- Is that the AOL Garden game? Uh, no, that's, no. That's, uh, limited to- uh... Well, that people have tried and it, it just doesn't scale. You know, how do you scale something to 2.9 billion users across the entire geopolitical space of the planet? So the legal framework for this is terrifying. Because uh, it just doesn't work. Um, sorry, I went sideways there. Um, we've got to protect p 
people. It's not just protecting children. That's the bit. The, the, if we save the life of one child, this is an eminently sensible thing. Please, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying we've got to protect everybody. And that means splitting the oil and water. Now, what justification is there actually for being on the internet in an, in an anonymous way? And the answer is the vast majority of what you do on the internet is not anonymous and you are willing to do it. You go to Tesco's. You can't shop at Tesco's online being anonymous because your food doesn't arrive. You know, you can't order pizza. You can't pay, a, pay your gas bill. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we do where anonymity is impossible. I would contend there's an awful lot of social media where anonymity should be impossible. The problem is they don't want to do it because it would collapse them. Um, there are, of course, let me put this in, it's a very important point, there are some places where anonymity is absolutely required. The Samaritans. There are certain places which have to be anonymous and we have to allow for that. Okay, we cannot sweep that away because that's certainly not for the greater good. But I come back to this thread that's run through all of this, which is trust and part of trust is identity. Why are we trusting any site that we go to? Why are we trusting any service that we use? Why are we trusting the search engine that we use? Why are we trusting the email service that we use in the cloud? Why are you trusting it? If you're happy to say, well, you know, I don't care. Great. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not trying to enforce something on you. What I'm saying, though, is you have to have the conversation. You have to have the thought process that walks you down the decision process and come to a conclusion at the end. And people aren't doing that. And that's why I started off with my first slide saying trust is the only metric. And find me companies out there in the Internet space that you could honestly call trustworthy. And it's all our fault. Thank you.